surprised my hair isn't a mess from last night, actually. Uh, mine is a little bit, but it is what it is. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. You know, I'm surprised it wasn't both of us going at each other last night, if you catch my drift. Oh, man, I don't know, man. <laughs> You're a pretty handsome dude. I don't know. Oh, bro, trust me. I get that very often, very often. You know, it's not only my girl that says that to me. It's every single girl I walk by on my university campus. This is the exact same thing. Wow, how did God make you so handsome? I just tell them, you know, I'm genetically gifted. <laughs> hey, man, you got a sharp jawline. I don't know what to tell you. Of course, bro. I hit those, you know those jawline exercises? Mm-hmm. Bro, I actually hit those every day in the gym. Like, between really? my sets, I'm going like... That's really and funny. People, every, oh, yeah, you know, everybody in the gym is looking at me like, what is this weirdo doing, you know? Mm. I catch all the looks. Sometimes I think they're looking because like, wow, how's this guy so jacked? And then I realize they're looking at my face. Yeah, man, it's the jawline. <laughs> like, it's funny, yeah. from all of my years working out, I've noticed that people don't really care how jacked you are unless you're like, insanely jacked for the most part no one's paying attention to you unless you just like are a good looking person or if you have a fat butt mm. i guess oh you got a fat butt my guy i mean i have a little bit of a dumpy i'm not gonna lie but it's not it's not crazy <laughs> <laughs> Yo, what do you do to work out your gluteus maximus to work out my glutes the two most important things i do to work out my glutes are squats mm. and hip thrusts Hip thrusts are probably the best workout if you're trying to glow your glutes, that, and then also maybe lunges. I'd say those are like my top three. Bro, what's your craziest gym experience? My craziest gym experience? <sighs> you know, I don't even know if I have like crazy gym experience. I know a lot of people that do, but I wouldn't feel right taking one of their stories. For me, every time I go to the gym, it's always been pretty straightforward. I go in, I'll lift mm -hmm. some weight, put it down, and then I go home. Like the craziest thing I can think of is, I don't know, one time I went to the gym, I for the first time in my life, I thought of, oh, and this was when I was a teenager, but I was like, oh, mm -hmm. that girl's kind of cute. Let me go approach her and try to ask her out. And I got rejected. And then I, <laughs> I just never showed my face mm -hmm. in that gym again for like the next two <laughs> months because I was just afraid I would mm -hmm. see her again. That's probably the craziest oh, okay. thing that ever happened to me do you think the fear of rejection you experienced when talking to that girl helped boost your confidence down the line where it's like i showed myself i can do the approach no honestly i'd say that oddly enough i always had kind of a weird personality where i was like strangely insecure but then also had a bit of a god complex it's a weird thing but i guess nowadays it's pretty common so growing up actually it was weird i had kind of the opposite thing going on where i was really really confident in terms of approaching and talking to women but then the more i got rejected the more insecure i became and then it kind of slowed my ability to talk to women down a lot more because before i had no issue i'd mm -hmm. walk up to any girl in the street and say hey what's up you know but over mm -hmm. time it became just like i'm just not gonna even bother what do you mean by god complex okay being in the state of mind that I'm the center of my universe, at least, I don't want to say the universe, I was still pretty self-aware, but just kind of seeing myself as the most important thing in my life, with that came an air of superiority, I suppose, where it was like, oh, I'm the most intelligent, I'm the most creative, I'm the most talented, no one has anything on me, I'm the best. But it's weird, because like I said, it's just the conflicting personalities, so one minute, I'm the best at everything. Thing ever no one can compete mm. with me and then the next wow i am the worst i can't do anything mm. right so it's just a weird conflicting of personalities do you think the sense of superiority people develop in superiority complexes stems from a feeling of insecurity oh yeah of course definitely i don't think you get to that feeling of superiority without having some form of insecurity going on within yourself in the first place because mm -hmm. i think it stems from being in a headspace where you just feel like you're not good enough so you over overcompensate by trying to essentially fake it till you make it but it's i think it's a little bit more subconscious than at the presence of the conscious mind sense of giving yourself that feeling of superiority to cover your inferiority to create a sort of a mask yeah pretty much oh fair do you feel people always wear masks or they usually decide to take that mask off for certain people oh man everyone has a mask on all the time what do you mean yeah i feel like that's obvious i don't think anyone goes out outside without putting on a mask for other people to see mm -hmm. the deepest parts of ourselves the parts that we hold true and that we don't show 
we're by ourselves, everyone wears a mask. I wear a mask when I go outside. I'm pretty sure you probably do too. Do you think people wear masks because they feel that others won't accept them for who they are? Yeah, that, that's probably a, that's a fair question. I guess that's the big question, right? The reason um, why everyone wears masks. I think it's more of a learned behavior because, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's a conscious fear. I think it's mm -hmm. something that it's just society has taught us that it's not okay to behave particular ways in public, that certain personality traits shouldn't be displayed in public and so people just begin to subconsciously hide those personality traits or those behaviors so as to be a little bit more socially acceptable i don't think it's something that we're all really conscious of when we're doing it mm -hmm. but i feel like once people start to become a little bit more conscious of it then they start fighting back a little bit so to speak for lack of a better word because then you realize i'm conforming to the societal norm why am i doing this i can totally do mm -hmm. whatever i want whenever i want we have free will so it reminds me of a phenomenon in psychology revert to the dramatological approach where mm. they say that people in the public sphere are acting in a matter they want others to perceive them in a positive light yeah while in private they act like who they are i believe that the most fulfilled people act similarly in public and in private they're able to yeah. take off the mask and have people accept them for who they are and in yeah. order to have somebody do that you must embark on a journey as you did so what started the journey of self-improvement? Man, my journey of self-improvement, that's been going on for a long time. If I'm being honest, it's been a pretty disgustingly long time <laughs> that my journey's been going on. But the actual improvement part probably didn't start until about two or three months ago. I would say that I probably had my moments where I'd dip my toe in over the past 10 years, maybe trying to get myself back to a place where I wanted to be. It's been fairly recent, the past two or three months where I started to actually see the improvement part of the mm -hmm. self-improvement <laughs> journey. Yeah, the thing I've realized about the self-improvement community is everybody sits on YouTube, they sit and read books, they consume all the information in the world. But mm -hmm. they don't do anything on that information. They literally sit on it. It's not yeah. until you take a little bit of information and consistently apply it that you're able to see progress. And one of the biggest ways I've seen to keep people motivated or to keep them in check in terms of that is when they start making videos of themselves and their journey. Is that a reason as to why you started also making videos about yourself along the journey to sort of serve as a companion and something to keep you in check? You know, I don't, I don't even know. Honestly, when I first started, I started going to therapy, I started going to church, I started praying, I started meditating. And then the thing that I was using to keep myself in check was I started using a, a journal. I had a journal. Mm -hmm. I had both an audio journal and a physical journal. This is the physical one right here, actually. It's kind of small, but it gets the job done. I was using my journal and that was what was keeping me in check. Every day, no matter what was going on, I'd find some time to put aside and check in with myself. I'd either record voice notes on my phone and that would be my audio journal if I didn't have my physical one available. And when I got home, I'd use the physical one and just write in it and log what was going on with myself. Oh, and bro, you're on a roll too. You cut off. <laughs> Oh, damn. You cut off a little bit too. I didn't even realize until just now. It's cool. Where did it cut off for you? It cut off at the audio journal and the written journal and how you're taking voice notes on the audio journal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So throughout my days, I would record in my audio journal if I didn't have my physical one available. Once I had the physical one available, I'd write in it. And that was basically it. I was just, are you taking pre-workout right now, <laughs> dude? <laughs> are you dry scooping too? That's crazy. Dry scooping in the middle of the podcast is wild, dude. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm going to cut that part out and we're going to put that as a short. <laughs> yeah, man. That's wild. All right. But no, yeah. That's, that's how I was mainly keeping myself in check was with the audio and the physical journal at some point i don't know maybe subconsciously that is why i started doing the youtube videos to help keep myself in check along my journey but at the moment it was just a feeling you know i was doing all of these other things and i was like let me just make a youtube video i think for me it, it stemmed a little bit more from the fact that i i am a filmmaker you know i went mm -hmm. to film school i studied it and i've always loved it and i loved the art of creating so for me i mean i'm sure you've seen it you've gone back and seen that i've been making youtube videos for a while but it was just the self-improvement stuff that just started recently. So I think it stemmed a little bit more from that. Me just wanting to continue to make videos, but it kind of was knocking two birds out with one stone. Uh, Fair. What do you enjoy about creative pursuits? As you discussed, you love art, you love music, cinematography, mm -hmm. museum art. 
I think the number one reason that I love creative pursuits is because, at least for myself, they've always provided an escape. I won't shy away from the fact that I didn't necessarily have a great upbringing. There were moments that were less than stellar, and so I always would seek out some kind of break from having to experience my life, I guess. Art, music, film, all of those things always provided me with an outlet and a way to uh, get out of it and to get out of my head, even mm -hmm. if it's just for three minutes, an hour, two hours, whatever. And so that's kind of where I ended up. And they were always also just like the most accessible things to provide me with that escape. I could always mm -hmm. just plug in my AirPods if I'm having a bad day or my earphones at the time and listen to music. I could always sit down and watch a movie on Netflix or Amazon Prime or something if I'm having a bad day. And back then, before I started getting into photography with an actual camera, I'd just grab my iPod and walk outside with my little iPod touch, start taking photos of things. And mm -hmm. that was my photography journey at the time. But it was easy. It was accessible. Do you feel that we spend the rest of our adult life fixing the scars we experience as children? I'd say for for some, yes. I feel as though it depends on where you are. It depends on a, on a myriad of things. Your self-awareness, your when you started the journey, how quick you caught it. It's kind of like, and I hate likening it to this, but because it's obviously not cancer, but it's kind of like cancer in just in that way, where if you catch it early on enough, I feel like it's a lot quicker to manage it and fix it and become healed from it but if you catch it while it's like really really late like let's say you catch on to the fact that you're you have so much trauma when you're like 40 it becomes something that ends up taking the rest of your life to heal from bro you're no on way. such a roll too man i don't know what's going on with my internet right now where did i cut off you cut off where it's like a cancer and you gotta cut it out yeah yeah okay so it's just like i was just saying that it's just like cancer in the way that it depends on when you catch it you know where if you catch it early on enough you can cut it out heal from it and resolve it really quickly but if it's later down the line let's say when you're like 40 50 years old it's a lot harder to maybe mm -hmm. heal from it because at that point it's been sitting for so long unresolved that maybe it does become a pursuit that ends up taking the rest of your life you know i'm reading a book it's called mindsight and mindset refers to your ability to perceive your own mind and your experiences and that essentially comes down to reflecting on what's occurred to you in your past through being very objective of the events that happened to have it close to reality being open enough to look at the events to understand them the ability to observe the event itself and in that book they discuss how if you're able to cultivate that sense of mind sight even later on then you're able to reflect on the experiences that sort of define you you know chrisma on command by any chance i'm not sure i can say i'm familiar with it they discuss on their youtube channel that a lot of people sort of create an identity in middle school and then use that identity to define them for the rest of their life so during one of the lowest points in my life i had to change how i perceive myself from being that little kid stuck in the corner crying away his problems to actually taking responsibility for what happened, accepting that there's nothing I can do to change the past, nor should I be worrying about the future. I need to be focused on what I can do right now to mm. fix the problems I have around me. Because I do think that in our moments of despair, we fail to realize that the only thing we have is the present moment. That is the only thing we have. All yeah. the money goes away. All the women goes away. It's just God and the present moment. So how do you find that your connection with God's benefited you through your journey of self-improvement? It's a good question. I would say that it's benefited me the most because it's it's grounded me a lot. I can definitely say that before I would always try to rely on myself to solve every problem. But the issue that came along with that was that at some point, you know, there's only so much you can do. And there's only so much you can handle. But when you allow yourself to rely on on God, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's allowing yourself to submit yourself to a higher power. Mm -hmm. So the things that do fall out of your control, it becomes sort of like a weight lifted off of your shoulders, because mm -hmm. it's no longer something that's weighing on you, you've allowed it to be taken on by the hands of a greater presence than yourself and i think that mm. that's benefited me the most because like i said we're, we're human there's only so much we can handle and i yeah. experienced a lot of breaking points before i realized i can't handle that many breaking points <laughs> yeah. So. yeah that's why i really resonated with your channel as well because i do feel that we have very similar messages we talk about god self-improvement all those aspects and that's something i've noticed a lot in the self-improvement community where as you know the self-improvement gurus like hamza first man these type of guys they never bring god into the equation 
one thing that's really helped me and the people around me and you as well is the connection to God. Yeah. I think it's such a big portion of the journey itself and people tend to ignore it. Yeah. They think like, oh, we don't need to worry about religion. But the thing is, the answer is literally right in front of you. Religion, the core messages it gives you is exactly what self-improvement is saying. And the funny thing is, these are tried and tested like Christianity, yeah. Islam. They've created civilizations. But what has this yeah. modern self-improvement movement really done? It hasn't done anything. Oh man, I don't want to sound like I'm judging. Just teenage who think that this is the form of self-improvement that's going to turn them into millionaires and that's all that they care about is just the money but real self-improvement isn't just financial it's spiritual it's mental it's emotional it mm -hmm. takes on a level that's a lot deeper than just financial and i think something that comes with that self-improvement journey obviously for a lot of people not for everyone but for a lot of people it does end up manifesting itself in a more financial form but i think mm -hmm. that also just is a testament maybe to how strong your relationship is with god i do believe that there needs to be more of a presence in of that because like you said it's all of these civilizations the the methods have been tried and tested they obviously work and any religion that you follow, the self-improvement is at the center of. And that's why I always share on my channel as well that I don't really think there's any particular religion you need to follow. I always say that I don't think that you necessarily have to follow Christianity or you necessarily have to follow Islam or any one or the other. Just as long as you're following something, then it gives you that grounding. It gives you that base to really improve upon yourself. Funny story. So I was just sitting in the car and talking to my friend mm -hmm. and I was telling him literally you can put me in jail you can take away everything from me but one thing you cannot take away from me is my belief in god yeah that's one thing that's always going to stay consistent and it keeps me grounded right mm -hmm. i do feel that those who don't have that end up being nihilistic where they believe that life itself is meaningless yeah and that addictive feeling they get towards being nihilistic is something i've noticed a lot online especially with this black girl community mm -hmm. they think the only thing that matters is looks this absolute utter yeah. nonsense and they get fixated on the fact that if looks is the only thing that matters then i don't need to worry about anything else i think that's a very dangerous defeatist mentality yeah i could agree i mean as someone who was nihilistic at one point i can definitely agree being nihilistic was not really the best for me it probably did create some of my best streams of thought my best streams of consciousness came out of being nihilistic but of the same coin it was very torturous especially when you do only focus on looks because that was something that was present for me as well i would only focus on the way that i looked and that was mm -hmm. torturous as well because you become obsessive over things that don't necessarily matter, like the weight on the scale or the how slim you look today or how fat you look today. Oh, do I look muscular enough right now? And I mean, don't get me wrong. I still love working out. I still love getting strong. And but it's not as important, whereas before those things were like the center of my world. Now it's like they're just a feature. And I think that's what it should be, because when you become obsessed over those things, everything else kind of falls to the back burner. And that's how you end up in the position that I was in, which which was that my relationships started to fail, not just with my family, but with friends, with my girlfriend. It's just things that should be important, that you should be prioritizing, fall to the mm. back burner. And then it's also damaging in that way because you're in this state of mind that it doesn't matter. Nothing matters, which isn't the case. It's not true. Things do mm. matter. And I'd make the argument that if nothing matters, then everything matters. It's the same thing as like if you were to say, oh, everyone's ugly okay so if everyone's ugly then no one's ugly because we're all on the same level it doesn't make sense it's not possible mm. so i think the nihilistic approach not only is damaging but in a way also maybe doesn't make sense <laughs> but i don't yeah. know that's just me it's like what a man thinketh he becomes where you're consistently consumed by thoughts of negativity and that results in you becoming somebody who's very insecure oh yeah definitely yeah you allow your negative then, thoughts to overcome you yeah and when you let those negative thoughts overcome you you tend to take that out on others and that pushes mm -hmm. away all those around you who could have provided you that support and guidance because people they can only be with you for so long before they decide to take a step back and allow you to fix yourself yeah yeah. And that's what happened with me. I was in that state for so long that everyone that I loved and who was always trying to reach out to me and help me, they eventually reached their breaking point with it. And they were like, okay, you just do it yourself then. And they all stepped back. And I think that's kind of where my, the like I said, the improvement part of my self-improvement journey really started because mm -hmm. that's what happened two or three months ago. Everyone finally said, okay. And then they stepped back and just left me to my own devices. And that's when I realized that I really do need to make a change. As they famously say, you 
are your greatest enemy. You are who awaits for you in the caves and forests you experience during nightmares. Mm. And it's when you're able to confront that reality, gaze into the abyss, allow it to gaze back at you, reflect on what is down there, are you able to change? Because I've realized that a lot of men or young men, their self-improvement journey always starts at their lowest point, Mm -hmm. a point where they break and then they either decide, okay, I'm going to let this break define me for the rest of my life and consistently live in a feeling of insecurity, a feeling of I'm not enough, or I can use this to change and improve myself to get to be the person I want to be. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, you need to have a goal. You need to define who that person is. And what I've noticed is a lot of people start on the journey, but they don't know where they're going. They don't have the roadmap laid in front of them yeah. even us to an extent like we don't know where this is taking us the only thing we know is that we have people we look up to and we aim to embody their traits however mm-hmm. even in that pursuit we can lose ourselves trying to emulate our role models i was going to ask you what your opinions on patrick but david is or the other some other youtubers you may look up to i'm gonna be honest i wouldn't have recognized the name if you threw it at me <laughs> so it's all good honestly i don't really look up to anyone i guess you could maybe say i look up to god obviously it's god but it's kind of weird to say it now because i always looked at it negatively but i grew up without a father and so now mm-hmm. i think that maybe one of the benefits of having grown up without a father is that I don't have a real physical person to look up to. And to some people that may be a detriment, but to me, I was able to benefit from it because it allowed me to instead look upon a version of myself in the future to look up to instead of having Mm -hmm. a a person that's real and flawed and carries traits that maybe don't necessarily complement being the person that I want to be I can just visualize this is the person that I want to be at this point and just pursue that going back and looking back when i started this journey the main thing that i always kept repeating to myself is that by the end of my journey the man that i want to be is the man that a 10 year old version of myself would be proud of Hmm. when he got to that point and so that's kind of been what's been guiding me obviously i still have a way to go from that but that's kind of what's been guiding me i don't really have any in real life idols or people that i look up to it's just kind of that manifestation of myself uh the idealized figure you had of a father figure during 10 years old mm, yeah fair 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 what do you think so far no wow, you're doing great man of course look when it's us two together on camera obviously it's going to be a phenomenal experience yeah yeah of course exactly as you know the ladies are looking at this video going wow well, <laughs> So much handsomeness on one screen. Hey, man. We get one more person, the screen might explode. Oh, very true, very true. I think next time, next time, next time. We'll get another person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, let's get to the question we're supposed to start with, Mm -hmm. but we just went right into it. So let's say, Ethan, you're on a desert island all alone. And you're looking up at the palm trees and thinking, I really want to read a book right now. What Mm. book would that be? I'm not even going to lie to you. This is a really tough question for me. If I'm trapped on a desert island and I had to read a book, what book would it be? Yo, me, obviously, because I want to be a millionaire. I'll be whipping out the, this book right here. Mm -hmm. The accounting game. (laughs) Lemonade. (laughs) Of course, I'll start my own lemonade stand on the island. Obviously, there's not going to be any customers, but at least I get it to practice if we catch my trip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) It's a really it's a really rough question because it's hard for me to choose one book i have books that i really really enjoy but it's hard to decide which one would be the one that would kind of i'd be okay with reading over and over again i liked 1984 by george orwell i liked the alchemist the art of war by sun Tzu. i guess is a classic for anyone who is seeking self-improvement but if i'm being honest since i was a kid my favorite books have always been the harry potter series i don't know maybe one of those Because again, it just provides me with that sense of escape. Like I'm trapped on an island. I might as well (laughs) have a movie playing in my mind. Oh, fair. But I don't know if I want the movie while if the cobra is right in front of me. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to figure out what to do. Like, how do I deal with the cobra? How do I deal with the panther over here? Where do I get water from? Because I'm not trying to get down on the island. And then out of nowhere, I have diarrhea going on. I lose all my hydration. So I think for me personally survival guide survival guide this probably sounds really really cocky of me but i don't think i would need a survival guide i'm sure i'd figure it out (laughs) one way or another either i die or i don't that's that's kind of it but bro think about it like you're walking up the tree right and you need Mm -hmm. fruits Mm -hmm. so how do you know which fruit is poisonous which isn't that's a good question man you got to find out the hard way i guess No, (laughs) That's (laughs) that's it i mean for me 
personally, I'll be honest, I'm a big fan of meat anyways, so I'm probably not looking at the plants to begin with. I'm probably trying to see if I can fish, if I can maybe find some creatures on the land that I can hunt. I'm not sure that I'd be immediately going towards plants. But then, then how do you skin the animal? That's what rocks are for, man. Did I already took a, I took a class a, a while ago when, when I was in mm. a school on like ancient caveman tools. So I think at this point, I kind of know how to maybe roughly fashion myself some kind of knife out of a rock so probably that oh, fair enough man. but let's say like the apocalypse starts right now we wake up tomorrow russia has nuked america it's okay all apocalyptic scene where mm. would you go to maximize your chance of survival to maximize my chance of survival if i'm hmm pretend there's no radiation i'd probably go somewhere maybe in the middle of the the states the midwest mm -hmm. you have lots of big open fields you could probably find yourself in a pretty secluded area surrounded by woods plus i just love the idea of actually having weather so there's that mm -hmm. i don't know man just find a bunker <laughs> Hop in, call it a day. Yeah, I'm trying to find where Mark Zuckerberg keeps his bunker, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Well, look, if the apocalypse <laughs> happens, you might as well live a bougie life. Mm, mm, I get that. I don't know if Mark Zuckerberg is letting you into his <laughs> bunker, though. Persuade my way in. I'll persuade my way in. I'll, like, look, it's a net benefit for both of us. You know, I'm a handsome guy. You, you're not that handsome. So I can teach mm. you my ways. You're going to tell Mark Zuckerberg he's not handsome? <laughs> of course. That's wild. And, uh, this entire YouTube video is getting thrown off the platform. We're going to get banned for that one. Oh, well, <laughs> probably not. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't own YouTube. Not yet, at least. But I don't know, bro. He might slide a little call to the YouTube CEO. He's like, oh, Ethan is your hobby. Say, I'm ugly. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I wasn't the one that said it. That was you, man. <laughs> oh, look, look. If I'm going to get you, <laughs> you thought it was ugly. I said nothing. Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> if you ever somehow come across this video, I think you are an incredibly handsome man. Thank I you. vehemently oppose that. You are absolutely, utterly not handsome. Compared to us, of course. Compared to us. Hey, well, no one's comparing to us. I never said compared to us, but I, Mark Zuckerberg, don't delete my Instagram account, please. It, my either, my either, my either. In fact, just boost it on the algorithm for us a little bit while I'm trying. <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay, now now you want Mark Zuckerberg to boost. Of course, of course. I might have to resort to some petty astro if it gets her. Mm. Nice. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Do you think it's important for men in general to develop survival skills? Yeah, if I'm being honest, yeah. And I know this might come across as being a little maybe more traditional. I'll be completely 100% straightforward uh, honest about the fact i was raised in a traditional household i was raised in a fairly traditional manner i won't shy away from that but i do kind of believe that as a man it kind of is on you to be a little bit more of a provider and part of being a provider would entail being able to protect the ones that you're providing for and if you have no survival skills, it's just not feasible to achieve that status as a man. So in that regard, at least, I do believe a man could benefit at least a little bit. You don't necessarily have to go into becoming John Wick, but just enough to, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but just enough to where you can protect the ones you love. You can protect yourself more importantly, because I've always placed value in being able to survive, which is why I spent a decent amount of time learning how to fight, learning how to survive. I guess it's probably also just because of the environment I grew up in in the first place. <laughs> so mm -hmm. is that too? Yeah, so it seems like it provides a sense of security and comfort to all those around you or you have that baseline of competence. Yeah. When you refer to fighting, are you referring to the martial arts? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I'm referring to martial arts. I began studying mixed martial arts a while ago. I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm the best. I'm not going to be able to take on like Conor McGregor if he were to approach me. He would probably tear me apart part like honestly but i started off with boxing and i'd say that i'm a fairly proficient boxer but then i got into mixed martial arts so yeah for the most part i can handle my own fairly well where i really started was believe it or not in street fights school fights i started fighting very young and i think that's another part of the reason as to why i say like it's it was kind of the environment for me i didn't necessarily go out of my way at first to be like oh i want to learn how to fight it was something i was just kind of thrown into because i had to keep getting into fights as a kid and it was like okay if i'm gonna keep fighting i have to get better i have to learn how to actually beat someone up and i mean not to brag on myself but to this day, I still haven't lost a fight to anybody that I fought now. Undefeated.
<laughs> undefeated in the sheets, as they famously exactly. say. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. Whereas I think we're I both mean, on the same page in terms of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'd say undefeated in the sheets. <laughs> I won't lie. There's been some moments. <laughs> There's There have been moments. Oh. But you know, I'm just sitting here and pretending none of those moments happened. <laughs> yeah, we could do that. We could do that. We'll pretend none of those moments happened. Yeah, undefeated in the streets and undefeated in the sheets. What do you mean? That that never happened. But of course, um, of course. no, yeah, that's not to say that if I ever got approached by like Mike Tyson or Floyd Mayweather, that they wouldn't lay me out in a second. They most definitely would. But <laughs> so far as the people that I've fought in real life, I'm glad to say I'm undefeated. <laughs> Oh man. Yo, what are your opinions on anime? My opinions on anime. This yeah. is this is where it gets a little interesting, I guess. I don't know, man. I have like a weird relationship with anime. It's a uh, I got into anime when I was really really young. In that regard, I guess I I love anime, but I'm also very picky about anime. I like I I've never been able to just get into just any anime. I started off when I was a kid with watching anime like One Piece, Bleach, Inuyasha, Yu Yu Hakusho, Cowboy Bebop, Samurai Champloo, Death Note, obviously, Full Metal Alchemist, just a lot of shows like that. I always loved all of them, obviously Naruto and Dragon Ball, because those are also like a part of the big three. So I always loved anime, but then I guess I had a point where I was like maybe 11 years old that I just stopped altogether and I went on like a kind of anime hater arc for myself where anytime anyone would bring up anime i'd like super oppose it until around the time i think maybe i was like 17 or 18 where i got back into it again got back into like attack on titan demon slayer jujitsu kaisen all of those kinds of shows so it's weird but i still have a lot of anime that people try to recommend to me and i'm just like i don't even want to bother man sword art online i'm sorry controversial take I can't get into Sword Art Online, man. <laughs> I can't do Sword Art Online. My brother always tried to get me into Haikyuu. I can't do Haikyuu. I'm not a fan of the sports anime. Like, I'm not going to watch anime to watch people hit a ball. <laughs> I, like, we have that in real life already. I feel like I'm good. Fair what about enough. you? I'm literally the biggest anime card you'll ever meet in your life. Okay. I'm so bad. I'm caught up on One Piece completely. That's crazy. Caught up on Blue Lock. I read Naruto all the way through. I was literally on the manga on Naruto, on the manga on Bleach. Mm -hmm. That's how much of an anime fan I am. Hey, listen, you're not alone in that. When you're talking the big three, well, maybe not One Piece for me. I'm not that big into One Piece. I used to read the manga for One Piece when I was a kid. But after I went on my anime hater arc, I realized like that's a long time to be away from One Piece. So I tried to come back and then I was like, no, it's too far gone. I'm not even going to bother <laughs> because it's just it's too deep. But no, I read the Bleach manga all the way through. I read the Naruto manga all the way through. I read Dragon Ball all the way through. Not Dragon Ball Z, just Dragon Ball. Dragon Ball Z kind of I'm not that much of a fan as much to be honest I, I was a big fan of all the manga back then i'm just okay i just watched the anime mostly at this point you know what i've realized a lot of people our age around our age that are also doing the self-improvement journey or similar things on youtube they all watch anime all go through like the journaling what are your opinions on nofap nofap See, I guess this is another part of the conversation that's just weird for me because it's not that I believe in no fap. I don't really care, but this is just, it's the way that it's always been for me. Ever since I hit puberty, anyone you ask will tell you, I just never had the urge. I don't really care for it. I don't really like to. Yeah. If I'm being so honest. You're saying like, you've never fondled your own cucumber. Never, ever. Well, I'm not going to say I never did it. Obviously, I've done it out of curiosity or at the the behest of another female companion but for my own general pleasure it doesn't do much for me so i don't really like to partake really oh fair for me personally you know since puberty started until about i think 20 i'm 23 mm. right now i was incessantly fapping so much three four times a day that's and crazy then, dude because of that i hit a major low because i do feel that fapping it's a waste of energy time you gotta sit down in your sheets or your washroom set up the situation, the dopamine mm -hmm. pursuit you feel, the negativity and guilt you feel afterwards that are associated with doing the activity has such yeah. an impact on me that it would literally prevent me from going to talk to women. So I quit cold turkey three years ago and mm. I haven't done it since. Nice. Nice. And Good stuff, I, man. I think I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I yeah. wish I was the same as you. Where I never really got into it. But obviously, in high school or middle school, 
everybody around you is like, bro, you got to try out this thing, search up this.com, red two. Mm -hmm. And then out of the general curiosity, you feel as a kid, you're like, let me check this thing out. Yeah. And then you get more. The issue I find is we listen to those around us rather Mm -hmm. than do the action just to fit in rather than sitting down, contemplating and thinking, is this something that's actually beneficial to me? Yeah. Is it going to negatively impact my health in the long term? But obviously, these are thoughts you're going to have as 12, 10-year-old kids. Mm -hmm. And those actions we take at that age are things we're going to spend a large chunk of our life trying to rewrite, to get rid of. Mm -hmm. And I do find that a lot of self-improvement is returning to a base state that you were before adopting all these negative societal habits, I know fab, the general sense of insecurity you feel about the events around you, your yeah. experience with women. Let's say as a six-year-old kid, you didn't care too much if Sally had a PP or if she had a little tutu. You yeah. just wanted to talk to Sally and have a fun time with her. And then over time, people push on the back like, oh, she's a woman. So you have to yeah. treat her differently. And mm-hmm. that sense of treating the person differently results in you sort of deifying the other gender, yeah, the other sex. I agree. Yeah. And what I've noticed, especially early on, is it's just treating everybody the same irregardless at first and then starting adopting the traits you want in terms of how you want to portray yourself to women. Because when mm-hmm. I first started, I literally had to go like, okay, don't even worry about the fact that it's a girl you're talking to or if it's a guy. Just enjoy your conversation. Enjoy the moment and find joy in what you're saying. Yeah. And then think about anything in terms of game, in terms of shit testing or female psychology, male psychology. That stuff in the beginning is too advanced to worry about because you want to slowly expose yourself to the situation. For example, if you want to get good in the club, you don't just go to the first club and expect yourself to get a girl right away. You want to yeah. expose yourself to overcoming the fear of rejection because the fear of rejection is what controls almost every single man on this earth is I don't want to get rejected by this female because then I can't pass on my progeny to the next generation. It's mm-hmm. evolutionary built into us to feel this fear of rejection. And we have to slowly hardwire ourselves to getting used to it. I Let's say you're doing sales. Let's say YouTube. Even when we started on YouTube, I don't know about you, but for me, I had to literally sit down and go like, okay, what are people going to think about me? And then I'd be like, okay, why am I concerned about what other people are thinking about me when I'm pursuing my goals, I'm pursuing my purpose. I should let the thoughts of others stop me. Mm. And we need to have the courage to be disliked and accept that not everyone's going to like us. We simply have a few people that we take advice and criticism from who really care about us. See what they say, take their feedback, appreciate it, and use that to improve ourselves rather than getting caught up on the voices of the people who surround us. Because most people say things out of envy, out of jealousy, because they see you doing things they want to do. Yeah. And the craziest thing is, you know, as human beings, we love ourselves the most, correct? Mm -hmm. If we love ourselves the most, why are we letting what others say stop us from doing what we want to do? That's kind of something that I I had to come to terms with on my journey as well, you know, and I realized that what people say is true. You have to think about yourself as if you were talking to your best friend, because at the end of the day, that's that's who you are. You love yourself. You're going to be your best friend. Would you ever say those things to your best friend? Like you're ugly. You should kill yourself. Things like that. No, you wouldn't say that. So why are you saying it to yourself? That's something that not only I benefited from, but I think a lot of people could benefit from if they really did try to practice that instead of Mm -hmm. just hearing it acknowledging it and then moving on we have to experience the thought experience the feelings because feelings nudge us to a certain direction it's understanding the direction that feeling is taking you towards why are you depressed you're depressed because certain circumstances in your life that's making you unhappy with who you are as a person depression itself can be used as a tool because it brings you closer to reality what's occurring around you accepting the truth And then using that to see what you can do better. But most people get hung up in the feeling like, oh, I'm depressed, or I'm depressed, or I'm depressed. They label themselves as somebody who's depressed. And that puts them in the mindset of being that person they've labeled themselves to be. Mm -hmm. We need to take a step back from the thoughts we're having, as you said. See, okay, are these thoughts actually me? Mm -hmm. Would I be telling this to my best friend? Yeah. No, I wouldn't be. What would I tell my best friend? I'll encourage my best friend. Things are hard now. During these moments of hardship, there will be ease at the end if you put in the necessary effort right now. But then even when it comes to the necessary effort, people don't want to bear the responsibility of that effort. Yeah, Because with that effort comes pain and people want to avoid experiencing pain when the only way you can improve as a person is by bearing as much pain and suffering as you can right now. And the only way you can do that is by finding the meaning or the why to push you through that suffering. And I do believe that comes at either a breaking point or you realize that there's something 
going on with this religion stuff. Yeah. I think that's actually what reignited my relationship with God was for a really long time, I would always blame God, right? You're going through so many things in life that aren't particularly positive. You start feeling as though God is picking on you. So then you get into a state of mind of, oh, why does God hate me? Why does God never allow me to have the things that I want? So on and so forth. So you kind of stray away. But then it took me going through years, I'm talking like a decade maybe, of that that line of thinking before I came to the realization that the suffering was for a purpose and that despite all of my suffering, I also noticed moments in my life where it was an example of how even though it may have felt as though God abandoned me, he never did. Just little moments where I was like, oh, that's a moment where I should have probably died actually, but I didn't. And that's God at work. And it brought me to a point where I realized that, yeah, my suffering was for a purpose. I think I understand what that purpose is now. And I, that's another part of the reason why I do the YouTube thing, because I think a part of it is that I'm meant to use my suffering as a way to reach others. But yeah, I, I don't know. I think for, like you said, it trying to understand what the suffering was for instead of just being like, oh, I'm mm -hmm. suffering. My life sucks. As we discussed, to find the meaning as to why you're suffering, what purpose is a suffering trying? trying to show me mm -hmm. and as you said in the moment you didn't realize what god was doing for you or yeah. you think what is good for you god knows maybe bad for you but what you think the moment is bad for you god knows in the long term it's actually good for you yeah and in those darkest moments i think we fail to realize that god is still there for you you just gotta look in the right places there's like a mm -hmm. famous saying in islam where they say the eyes are open but the heart is blind. They're blind to the truth. Mm -hmm. To seeing what's actually occurring around them. You just narrowly focus your attention on the pain you're going through. Not the lessons it's teaching you. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny that you say that because, sorry to interrupt, but it just, it brings me back to a, a quote I heard the other day, which really, really caught my attention where it was this guy speaking on how through your darkest times, it seems like, God isn't there and he isn't answering, but mm -hmm. that you just need to remember when you were in school, the mm -hmm. teacher was always silent when you were taking a test. Oh, that really hit right there. That really hit. Right? As you know, life itself <laughs> is a test. Oh, yeah. okay. That's slapped. I'm not even going to lie. I'm telling you, man, it got me. It got me. Oh, that got me right now, too. It's hard, right? Yeah, that was hard, bro. Holy. Oh, <laughs> uh, the teacher was silent during the test. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, that was a good one. I'm not going to lie. I'm telling you, man. I need to take... That really exposed me to some <laughs> hard facts right now. Holy. I need a moment to just comprehend what was said. <laughs> Yeah, you're good, man. I'm not a homo sapien. I'm just in love with Ethan. That's it. That's it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, That's you're not it. a homo sapien? What kind of... Uh, are you an alien? I'm extraterrestrial, bro. Of course. Yeah, yeah, okay. As okay. they famously say, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. I'm from Mars. I'm a Martian, bro. Men are from Mars. I always thought it was men are from uh, Jupiter. Jupiter? Yeah, you I mean, never maybe heard I'm that? just from Mars. Maybe I'm just from Mars. You never heard that old uh, saying in elementary school when they'd be like, oh, men come from Jupiter because they're more stupider? Oh, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I heard classic, that Jupiter man. is stupider. I don't know, mm -hmm. man. For me, you know, middle school, I don't know what was going on. I was a little lost. <laughs> it's all good, man. It happens to the best of us. Yeah, it, happen, it tends to happen a lot to me, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> hey, it is what it is. All right, Ethan, man. It was an absolute pleasure. We're going to do another one. Another yeah, one of course. together, obviously. Yeah. And, you know, we have some stuff working in the pipeline, a new YouTube channel. We'll just be mainly mm -hmm. doing podcasts on that channel. I hope all of you enjoyed the episode. Ethan here, and of course, the most handsome man you'll ever meet in your life, Shahab Khan himself. All right. <laughs> crazy, crazy way to exit for yourself. All right. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Are you trying to show off the drip? <laughs> you keep blurring out. <laughs> Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? 
I'd argue that I am. I don't know if I can speak for everyone else, but I am. Oh, if we're entertained, then they should be entertained too. Because the only thing that matters is us. (laughs) No, yeah, for sure. For sure.